Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, I j literally just had like a major, major glitch too. Yeah. Like I plugged in a light and everything went out. <laughs> literally like 30 seconds ago. Yeah, it was good times. It's so great doing this all by myself, running three cameras and four computers and all kinds. Of, it's just such great times. But uh, Yeah, it's the harbinger of what it's going to be like when we get back into film production. Less people, more jobs. Wait, you think yeah. less people? Why? Well, what's going to happen is that <clears throat> basically um, it'll be like I was just reading some, I was just reading some guidance on, on something like, for instance, they want to run Grip Electric with three people and no mandates, and that's it. And basically have a swing shift that comes in overnight and does some stuff. But on the set, as opposed to having five guys doing that stuff, you've got three, maybe even two. And uh, that's kind of going back to indie film days where you got like two people running grip and electric and that's it. And, um, so you can minimize contact. So it'll be more work for less people or there'll be more people just behind the scenes in different shifts, but on the ground, like on set, you're gonna be dealing with significantly fewer people. But I think that'll be that way for the first few weeks. And then people will just say, oh, I can't do this, I need more people, you know, and then People will just pile in and start working, and then it'll become a petri dish, and it'll all come back. And <laughs> petri dish right? for sure. Well, that's yeah. I, when I started getting into uh, the podcasting. I was doing all these research on other podcasters. It just seems like for whatever reason, I could only find comedians, which is it is what it is. Um, but I recently saw Brian Callen has one, and he is on a TV show, and. Um, he was saying that it would be skeleton crew on set, like in the, you know, on the stage. And then yeah. they would have a doctor there who would check your temperature every single day and all that, like literally on call. So no, I, think I think the key, the key to the whole thing is going to be testing. Um, and it's um, basically in order for the set to operate, I think I know what's going to happen. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm going to be doing it, which is I'm going to have a person checking everybody's temperature as they show up. And if anybody's got a fever um, and if they're exhibiting any kind of symptoms or whatever, the trick is going to be having available testing like flash testing. You go, okay. Same day test you, we won't be testing everybody. You test the people who are exhibiting something. And then if they do, then you do the contact tracing around them tell them to take the day off or a few days off or whatever. But that's the only way you can actually get back into production is if you have testing set up so that as people come in, you test them all in the beginning. And then as it goes, you test when people, you know, show up with a symptom or something like that, there will be nothing happening until that is established because without that, nobody, I mean, nobody's going to feel confident about going back. But, how, but some people are, don't have symptoms. They could just be carriers. So if you check my, temperature and I'm fine, but I still have it. How do you know that part? Well, what I was saying, like in the beginning, you test everybody okay. and then you can account for that point forward. And that's basically the best you can do, right? And go, okay, we've tested everybody who's involved in the production at this point. And, and then subsequently, if something occurs, there's something, then you, you go from there. But people will have, I think, you know, part of the debate is who's going to have the right to say, you can't test me. Like I have my privacy. I, I don't need to disclose anything to you. And or I think there will be people who say that. And, and then other people will say, well, if you have nothing to hide, you should take the test. And then, you know, there'll be this debate about privacy and, um, and people's rights. And I think that needs to be kind of sorted out. But the unions basically are the ones that 
will establish the best practices. I think right now it's all just a debate. It, we're all thinking what our best practices. We're all spitballing with each other, but I think the experts in this are the people working within the guilds and the unions to establish what the guidelines, and they're all talking to each other. And there is um, an overall, I, I can't remember, I think it's called the Labor Labor Practices Act or something of that nature, which dictates kind of the best practices overall. I mean, you know, SAG, without SAG clearance on this issue, nobody's going to shoot. You know, DGA, IATSE, the Teamsters, they, they're all going to establish the way to do it. I've seen a lot of um, breakdowns of what new procedures and protocols will be, like dividing the work in pods and 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 all that. Not having a production office, but having spaces that li- limited amount of people work in, in, you know, like wardrobe is here, art department is here, you know. Uh, but not within the shared space, not within like one unified production office. So it'd be like, you know, I'll like I'm here and I can, I can certainly do my work from here and call people and set things up and get emails and, you know, time cards and, you know, all the documents can be done electronically these days. So it's going to force our industry, which was really bad about being really fully electronic. It's going to force us to be really fully electronic as much as possible in terms of the admin. But, you know, there are a lot of people like, there are grips and, you know, drivers and stuff like that, that they don't, you know, they don't have smartphones. They still just don't even know how to use a computer, even no matter how much you try and guide them into it. Um, they still don't know how to operate certain stuff. There's like older people who don't like using it, um, but they're just going to have to get with it or else, you know, um, I mean, it's just this matter of policy. I tried to do it last year in a production where I wanted to make the entire workflow for accounting and sign up and, um, POs and everything. I wanted everything to be electronic and I couldn't get certain departments to get with that um, just because they just wanted paper. They wanted to sign something they want, you know, and um, we're in a day and age where that can go away and I'm hoping it goes away. Well, also, there'll be, sorry, there'll be more medics. Like that's the big thing. There's going to be basically normally you'd have a set medic and a construction medic. I think what we're going to have is like three or four medics on a show and those medics will be like all over this and they'll be the ones looking for things. They'll be quarantine designate or like, you know, infection does it, infection, infectious disease, you know, kind of reps where, you know, you can say, okay, you key PA, you have to watch this department. You in your department are going to be the person who enforces within your department. There'll be one person in each department that'll get some kind of a pay bump or something to say, okay, this is your additional responsibility beyond your stuff to look in your area and make sure everybody's complying. Well, to get, like I said, to get back to what you were saying before about, you know, I'm a, a guest spot or guest star or, or two day roll walk, you know, five day, whatever. I don't want to take the test. Goodbye. Like, I'm not, you know what I mean? It's like, there's so many other actors out there. I don't know if you can, I honestly don't think that any actor in this town, especially the ones that we know are ever going to be like, yeah, no, I'm not taking that test. You know what I mean? Like, I think they'd feel safer that it was that they were getting tested on set, obviously. Yeah, I had a, there was my friend, Lauren had a production and it's, it's, it's in the news. So it's out there. So it's not, I'm not uh, speaking out of turn, but it's the, the Paul Schrader movie with Oscar Isaac, Tiffany Haddish and uh, um, Willem Dafoe. They were shooting before the lockdowns and somebody came out from LA to uh, do like two days on the show. They were an actor. They did two days on the show. turned out they had coronavirus. And, uh, and then like, one day later, you know, they shut down well, along with everybody else. But um, that's a very real thing. You know, it can cut, it could just be one person showing up for one day's work. That could be the person. Um, and that's the thing we have to wrap our heads around is how to go, okay, you had it. All right. Who were you in contact with? Okay. We have to test all those people and check, but how do we do that and not stop production? Because, you know, when you really think about it, you know, um, production, production always just, you know, finds a way to continue going. Like I had a guy who got, you know, hit once and he like dislocated his fingers and it was like the first day of photography. And the first thing I'm thinking, where's the double, you know, like, okay, where's the double and I can shoot around. You're always finding a way to keep going forward. And, um, our whole position leading up to this was shut everything down. Okay, fine. Um, but on any, you know, on any show, there could be some kind of a contagion out there and you need to, you need to just understand it, understand how people get it and not be 
too quick to take a draconian measure. Just take an intelligent measure and figure out how you can move forward, in what ways you can move forward, and uh, do that while you address this. And if it evolves into something that's catastrophic, then you, you know, go in and uh, and and do something about it. That's the only way we'll be able to move forward. It's the only you you do your best and try and give people comfort that you're doing everything that you possibly can, not even within reason, like basically whatever the guidelines are that the unions come out with, we're gonna live up to those guidelines and then some, right? So nobody says, oh, you're just doing the minimum that people tell you that you have to do. No, I wanna do more than what people tell me I have to do. So I have, you know, kind of the, you know, the morality, the moral high ground of being able to say, I've done more than what people will say is the minimum because I do care or we do care, you know? and. Uh, we don't want anyone accusing us of not doing our best to, to do something. Um, but we also want, all want to go back to work. And the, the challenge is going to be when people don't speak up or say something or, you know, somebody could be a little sick and they're not saying anything about it because they just don't want to shut things down. That's a very real thing. And, and seeing through that and trying to really draw out from people, okay, are you, is there something? And then what's your duty to report to everybody if this one person says something, but, um, but in reality, if somebody's sick, you can't tell anybody who that is. That's, I think that's technically illegal to do. Um, um, because I know like, for instance, in many companies, uh, where there have been people who get coronavirus, all HR can do is tell the people in that business that some of your colleagues have contracted it although we cannot tell you who they are. It's their privacy, right? It's up to the individual person to disclose that they are the one, right? But as a company, I can't tell you. All I can tell you is there is exposure or somebody or whatever, but I can't tell you somebody else's private business, private medical business, right? Um, all I can tell you is you've been in contact with somebody, so you need to get checked out. You know, we'll get you checked out because somebody has had it. But uh, that's that's the minefield of you know liability and personal right uh, that we're gonna have to deal with, and um, yeah, it's a lot to wrap our heads around. Yeah. So we're, we're gonna be going back to the way that you and I used to shoot movies, which was just me, you, and whoever. Well, I was watching Werner Herzog's Masterclass, and he's like, when you really have to, all you need is you you have a cameraman and you run sound, and that's it. <laughs> that's it. Two people. But, and when you really think about it, that it's true. You can really, really, really strip down if you have to. But what always is challenging is, you know, when you're making movies at a certain scale and there's certain expectations, and if it's unionized filmmaking, you have a contract that tells you you can't, if somebody can't perform the duties of somebody else um, that, you know, that is a title position. So you technically have to hire somebody, even if you could do it yourself. And that's the that's the challenge with unionized filmmaking. Like I have friends overseas that are talking about how to reduce their crew foot, foot uh, their crew footprint and stuff like Eastern Europe and all that. There's still mechanically the a certain amount of people that you need to, to prepare and get things ready to run a, a film effectively, even at a minimum scale. But in the United States, the union contracts are structured in a way where you could only minimize that to a degree, but at a certain point you can't, do much more than that. So it's really going to be about the unions saying, all right, we'll make this concession for this period of time on this many productions until there's a vaccine or whatever. Um, but they're going to roll it back as soon as they can, because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to lose jobs for their people. Yeah. I mean, just listening to you talk about that, I'm going, you know, if I was on set and I was sick, I, you know, and I need that money, I'm not, going to tell you that I'm sick and that's just kind of puts a lot of people in jeopardy and I that's kind of an iffy I mean they're getting now they're getting away or getting around with it um, I've talked to many actresses who are doing this you know zoom style auditions and meetings and all that kind of stuff so you're, you're getting around that but they're still you know get, you can't do that scene in the club with you know 500 people all dancing around like how can you how will you be able to control something like that at this point? Kind of can't. It's funny because I think it's going to wind up making uh, 
you know, in, in the world of independent film, the thing that makes movies look cheap is the lack of extras, right? And, and the interesting thing about this is that you're not going to be able to have extras congregating too close to each other. So they're going to have to be all spread out. And it's going to have to look, even if you have the money to have the extras, you won't be able to have as many as you want. So I think it's going to be a trick of kind of the optical trickery. Okay, here's your angle. You stack people a certain way so that the, the frame looks busy, but they're actually, it's like forced perspective where, you know, they're actually really, really far apart. And you're, but that limits what you can do, you know, what you can shoot. You're shooting in this direction, it's locked, and that direction, it's locked. And it's going to be interesting to, um, to work that ratio. And it's funny because that's kind of what we do when we're trying to say, oh, you're, you say you need, you know, 2,000 people for, you know, uh, you know, for this independent movie, and I, I can only give you 500, <laughs> right? And that might be the reality of the same of this is like, okay, we have to make that number work. And and um, I have a scene in a movie that, if everything goes well, we'll be hopefully shooting in the fall. But really, that's it's all kind of in the air. If that plays out, it's kind of like a college party scene. So there'll be all these people around and you know, doing beer pong, beer, was it beer bombs? Yeah. Beer pong, yeah. <laughs> yeah, doing all that stuff. I'm thinking, how do you, how do you even begin to do that? And um, uh, there is going to be a way to do this. It's like everything else. Like whenever something happens, an event occurs, there, there's kind of an extreme reaction to it. And then people become more and more acclimated to it. We all know that there, you know, we believe that there will be a second spike due to people having an overconfidence or just being frustrated and wanting to get out and just saying, screw it, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put myself out there. I'm going to work on it, be careful and all that, but I just, I can't do this anymore being locked in my house. So they're going to do that. And then, and then there'll be an uptick and then people will freak out again. And, uh, and it'll just, you know, that this is the way people operate extremes and then they come out and then a little more and then, you know, and then things kind of balance out. I think we're probably before things are kind of normalized in the way that we know it uh, from in the world of production. I think we're probably a year, a year, year and a half to two years away from things being normal. What we consider normal uh, in the operation of a of a production. You know, we're like a usually like a hundred and twenty people. You know, all interfacing with each other and in close proximity to each other and. Um, it will definitely change how we feed people. You know, it'll be like box lunch and um, um, craft service. I've been thinking about a lot how people, you know, s grab things off the table and throw it back and stick their hands in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I've been thinking about that a lot. That's like the immediate. I think everybody's just been thinking about that, and I'm like, that that is over. We're we're probably going to transition to a, a model like they have in in uh, in Europe and some Eastern European countries that uh, I actually really like, which is they have a trailer or a truck with a counter on it with you know glass and you go okay I'd like this this and this and somebody gives it to you and that's um, a way that they do it in 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 other countries that I think would be good for us to do here be controlled uh, although in the other countries the interesting thing about that is that they actually charge the crew for it they go okay you want a banana and you want some water and you want this or that here's your limited things that are free <laughs> if you want Kind of, if you want to like these things that you're like, you want to spoil yourself, then you're going to have to pay for those things. Um, I'd like to see that adopted in the in our world, but you know, we're we're too we're just too uh, we feel too entitled. Yeah. In uh, in uh, larger scale filmmaking and in the United States. I mean, really, in in the scope of things, crafty. That's what their job is to make sure at the craft table. So to pay that extra crafty PA or whatever to sit behind the table and hand them their M&Ms. I don't think that that's too far fetched either though. I don't, I don't yep. know about charging me as an executive producer to go down there for a banana, but yeah. you know, like but I think you know, you're not going to have a table. I think it's going to be a place that you go with somebody okay. serving you and, and it's not going to be like as like right around the corner as it normally is. Um, I, uh, I think the first few, the first two to three weeks of any production are going to be very, 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 very paranoid and exhausting. And, and then by the, by the end of the second week into the third week, people are just going to go, okay, fine, let's just, you know, that's what's going to happen. That's just human nature. People are going to get fed up and not, uh, not that they're going to be complacent. They're just going to be tired of the restrictions and we'll just, 
do what they do. And I'm not endorsing that because I really, you know, I'm a production manager as well and I can't, you know, endorse people engaging in that kind of behavior, but they will. That's just human nature. Well, let's start there. I'm so, you know, you and I, we've been friends for a really long time and I've been doing a couple, it's like flashback Friday or whatever, because uh, I did somebody recent that we were, that introduced me to you originally. And um, I, I guess what I, I don't even know what you do. Like, I mean, I know what you do, but I mean, explain to, you know, what your job title is and I don't, you, you don't really need to go back. I know actually, if you want to go back, I'd be interested because I know you came out here to originally be a director and we did a bunch of movies. You put me in my first movie and all that. So um, I just wanted to see kind of, I guess, how you, you came out here to be a director and how that parlayed into what you're doing right now and, and, and what are you doing right now? Well, generally, um, I'm, a, I'm a producer, but I'm more of a physical producer. I'm, I'm, I'm what people call a line producer for the most part. Um, and what it is is that I, I know, I understand the psychology and the nuts and bolts of how to make a movie. And, um, and because I come from a background of directing as well as editorial, and I still actually to this day, I still edit projects, um, even during prep on movies, I'll, I'll edit a movie for a friend or something like that. But, you know, I still need to scr scratch that itch. But basically for me, I directed some things and then, and then I did some projects where I really felt like I was doing it as a job. And when I was doing it as a job, I didn't, as a job, I didn't feel any passion for it. So I just decided that if, the next time I direct, basically, it, it just has to be something that I'm very connected to that I feel like I'm the only one who could tell that story or I felt connected to it. And I, I really haven't felt that need since then. And um, since I'm good at filmmaking, uh, I just, well, why wouldn't I make a living, you know, doing that and, and use, use what I know um, in the filmmaking process. And, and you kind of, when you start out as a director, you kind of have to produce yourself anyways, and you have to do it for yourself anyways. So you take that disposition and just apply it to getting movies made. But basically um, what happened with me is that I, you know, I grew up in Miami and I was, you know, uh, working in the hotel industry. And, and I think the, the single greatest thing that I learned in the hotel industry is what served me well in the beginning of my career and to a degree still does which is this philosophy of you have to protect the interests of others and serve their needs discreetly when you work in the hotel business. So just apply that to working with producers and directors and actors. And, you know, you just have to do things and, uh, and know that you don't talk and you get things done and, and that's it. Um, so I was working as, as an extra, I started as an extra in movies in Miami, um, just kind of pinging around and I was in, striptease with Demi Moore and Blood and Wine and The Birdcage and um, a number of other films that um, that were filmed in South Florida while I was kind of in the, I think it was the early 90s. A lot of movies went to Miami and liked to shoot there. So um, then I uh, had met a guy on one movie uh, as an extra where, you know, I kind of connected with him and um, I had a lot of fair weather friends at the time. So I decided, well, I'm going to kind of drop off the map and I'm going to go to Cuba for a month and disappear. And I'm going to call back only the people who decide to, who noticed that I was gone and decided to reach out to me. So when I came back, there were two uh, messages on my answering machine back when you had answering machines. <laughs> and uh, one of them was this guy, Orlando Delbert, who you interviewed last week. Um, and, uh, and basically what happened was I, you know, he and I kind of connected and bonded. We were just then working in the scene in Miami. Um, he was dating somebody who um, was interested in going to a school in Orlando, Florida, um, uh, which was like a technical school for graphic design and music and all of that. Um, people in the music business know it very well. It's full sale. They make a lot of, you know, uh, you know, recording engineers and that kind of stuff. And I decided just to go up to visit the school with him um, uh, since he wanted to check it out anyways, I walked in and they gave me a tour of the school and I walked into this recording booth or, or this mixing booth and they started playing a scene from T2. Um, and it was the scene where Robert Patrick walks through the, um, the prison bars. And, and then I heard like the dink of the gun when he, you know, hits that. And I just got goosebumps 
and I realized, wow, this is a place where I could finally connect the dots of the thing that I really love, which is I really love movies and I really loved entertainment. And I had that knack for knowing who was doing it and what was coming out and all of that. And I felt like that, that what I now identify as the ability for cinema to be an, uh, um, an empathy device to connect with people, to, to um, express ideas and to, um, to express ideas and to communicate cross-culturally and, um, and movies are very, for I think for all of us when we're young, movies are very aspirational. You think, you know, uh, the, I, I want to get out of the day-to-day -day life and I can dream of another life through movies. I think we all do that. And, um, and I certainly had that like every, anybody else and I felt very kind of limited by the, the place that I was living in and, um, and I had a, I aspired for more. And, um, and so I decided, okay, I'm just going to go and do this. And I applied to the school and I got a grant to go in, but I couldn't afford uh, anywhere to live. M my friend Orlando had also gotten in for graphic design work. So he decided just to go and live in his truck in the parking lot of the school. And one month later, I was out there in my car living, you know, living in the parking lot of the school for about three months, um, just because I felt like, you know, I could not live another day in the li in the life that I had because I once you find this thing that you're meant for that's it like you don't want to waste any more time <laughs> you know looking for anything else because you're not looking for anything else you found the thing you th like the clear path has been shown to you that this is a direction that you have to head in and that's it like once that happens you just everything just deletes and just move on and just go so um, that was it and I got on with it and um, at first I I started, uh, I started in the film program and I started studying that. And then I realized that I needed a, a certain competitive advantage if I wanted to come and in, get into the film business. And um, ultimately, you know, what is important in the film business is that you have a strong s a sense of story and how to work with actors and um, um, uh, you have a strong visuals, uh, you know, visual, uh, visual spatial kind of nature, which I do. And um, um, so I went to the school and um, then just um, shifted programs from film into digital media because I felt like I needed to understand the way digital technology was going to affect filmmaking. And it was like, it was really foreign to me, but I kind of forced myself to learn it. And that was going to be my competitive advantage to get in because I figured there's all these people who are going to come out of film school trying to get into development, working as an assistant or whatever they're going to do. But I needed a job. I need to work. I need to eat. If I get, when you're a person who lives in their car, you you like you're I, like you got to get some food in your mouth and you got to find a way to learn something in what you love that'll pay you so that you can eat and that's like it was just preparing for year one how do I survive so um, at the end of that I came to California got in my car I fully expected to do the same thing and just live you know live like uh, uh, Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapon and <laughs> just park at the beach and, you know, figure it out from there, right? Yeah. But I got, I got very lucky um, in that somebody who I knew from Miami had made the Western migration many years earlier and she heard from a mutual friend that um, I was coming out to California and she actually went to USC to film school, but she wanted to be a musician. Uh, you know, so she went a whole different direction. But when I came out, it turned out that that was the first year that USC was sh allowing students to shoot their thesis films on the Sony DSR 200 camera. And uh, what was the final thing that I used in the digital media program was the Sony DSR 200 camera. So I shot her USC thesis film um, and w with that camera. And from that, um, you know, you just kind of you get along with people and you find a common language and people recommend you to other people. And that's how I ended up uh, being recommended to my friend James, who uh, was doing his his personal passion project over the weekends called The Decade, which is about fraternity hazing, being shot on a little VX1000. And I came in over a weekend and and shot it and um, and we connected and, and it was, you know, it was uh, very, you know, it, it, it just worked, you know, and, and uh, I was able to build my own editing system using a Mac that I got at school. And I ended up editing the movie and then I ended up doing another low budget movie. And I think you were involved in that one, uh, which was recoil. And, uh, and so I just, um, used my hotel skills to get a job as a temp in the studio system. 
So basically, I was working as a temp at MGM and Sony and Universal. You know, one day, one day, one day, one day, and then and then um, and then uh, on the weekends, I would work on every project that I could for free. And I'd try an AC, and I'd try to get jobs around town. And I got like an AC job here and an assistant editor job there. And then you helped me because you know I. Um, found a night job with you working at a club playing the lights. And I think for people who are visual spatial like us, who specialize in you know, lights and you know, all that kind of stuff, um, it, 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 was, I was, it was particularly kind of adept for uh, my nature. Um, um, then uh, what ended up happening is that just over the course of the year, you know, you just, I just kept doing small projects for people and, and putting things together. And, and at one point, you know, we all got kind of frustrated about projects that we were trying to put together. And I just decided, well, you know, basically, fuck it. I'm going to just grab a camera. We're going to like write a script in 16 days and, and, and shoot a movie. And we'll only use the money that we have in our pocket. And that's it. And what was in our pocket was $285. So, so we made a movie for $285 that, um, that in the process of making, I got caught in my day job at Sony and, um, and got let go. And I, I was so fast with shooting and editing and doing all that stuff that within like two or three weeks, I was finished with the movie and I was going into Sony to get my final paycheck. And we like sent, we did dollar store copies of the whole of the movie and sent it to everybody that we knew any, anybody and everybody that we knew. And uh, I went to pick up my final paycheck. And uh, I got a phone call from James saying, you know, are you, you know, sitting down? I was like, no, do I have to? He's like, yeah. So I did. And he said, well, the independent film channel, you know, Next Wave Films has seen the film, loves it and, um, and wants to purchase it or license it for IFC. And basically a year after we decided to make the film it premiered on the independent film channel and, and it just kind of, our paths kind of took off from there. Um, and, we also did uh, Sundance that that was the same time, right? We did Sundance too. Yeah. What happened what was interesting though was, uh, about that is that we didn't get into Sundance, but we got into Slam Dance. But IFC, because they they had seen what we did with the movie, they invited me into kind of helping with the finishing of this movie called Manic, which starred Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Zoe Deschanel, and Don Cheadle, which is their first movie that they were doing under their uh, Next Wave Films finishing banner. The first thing that I think they fully financed as a digital film, like IFC's first real true digital film, they wanted me to come in and kind of help them rank the post-production movie and it got into Sundance. So while we were at Sundance with that movie, we were at Slamdance across the street with their little $285 movie, you know, and it's, it's just, it's, there's just no excuse. There really isn't any excuse, you know, about not being able to have the resources and not, oh, I don't have enough to make that movie. They're all that I, I can tell you from kind of now perspective of working films that are like two hundred and eighty five dollars and you know a hundred million dollars. You never have enough money. You never have enough resources. You never have enough time. You never quite have the right cast. You never quite have the right crew. You never quite have the right conditions. But you figure it out and you make the best best movie you can under the parameters of the movie. And it's just a question of the ambitions of scale of what you have. Um, if you want to direct a hundred million dollar movie or you want to make a hundred million dollar movie keep waiting and you know, maybe your kid will do it after you're dead. You know, like it's just, you have to get on with it and just do it. And, and uh, I think the challenge with, with the business, with all of us is just dealing with, you know, frankly rejection and dealing with like, once you put yourself out there and you create something and, and people making you feel like, you know, what you've done is, is, is cute and everything, but not great or whatever. I, I've now seen that with like experienced directors, they're still struggling with that. They're, they, they still struggle with that, even with like big hits under their belts. So um, I just felt very strongly that I couldn't just kind of gig um, doing that. Um, Cause you know, we, after that we got represented and started taking meetings and, uh, and I was invited into a few projects that were kind of um, uh, trouble projects that I was able to come in and just fix and um, and because I was able to wrap my head around things and just think quickly and fix them, um, it that became the skill, that became the value set, that became the the thing of like, um, all right, you know how to do things inexpensively and creatively, and to sell them upstream creatively, not just go, you know, this is the cheap and fast way to do it, but this is more the creatively appropriate way to do it within our situation here. Um, 
that it attracted um, people who historically always have to find uh, creative ways to make good movies, or, you know, or deliverable movies, let's say, in the international pre-sales market. So, you know, kind of the world of the world of the people who came out of Canon Films and and uh, and and that that legacy were attracted to what digital technology could do, which is that you could streamline production, you can cut costs, you can, you know. And as a filmmaker, what I liked is that it gave me freedom or certain amounts of freedom or additional freedoms. So if the trade-off is that, you know, um, I'll use this piece of gear, but it gives me an extra day or it gives me more money for music if I can. You know, they're always, they're always going to say, can you save a hundred, can you save a hundred bucks by using this gear or whatever, by going to this place? You go, okay, I'm, I'm okay with saving the hundred bucks, but how about, can we save 75 and use 25 of that? Can we save a hundred, but uh, I'll give you back 75 of it and just give me another 25 to do this thing. So the whole thing's a, it's constantly a, a negotiation and a bargain to try and do better by the movie. Um, uh, because sometimes there's just this difference of, it's a small difference, but that small difference can make a huge difference. Like I did a small movie with um, uh, this guy who, Adam Robitel, who um, is a very talented guy. He recently directed Escape Room and Escape Room 2, and uh, he did uh, The Last Insidious and Paranormal Activity. The last He wrote The Last Paranormal Activity movie. But it all started with a very small $1 million movie uh, called the taking of Deborah Logan and um, on that movie we stretched it so far to accomplish so much that by the time we were done with it we had like a sequence that was really complex and he was like god if only we had you know a quarter of a million dollars to get that sequence or that big payoff moment in the film right uh, and I said no it wasn't two hundred fifty thousand dollars it all we all we would have needed would have been forty three thousand dollars that was the difference you just got to know what the difference is it's not about overspending money but where and how much makes the big difference. Like that $43,000 would have been a million dollars worth of emotional and screen impact for 43, not 250, right? So, you know, you kind of get, you get hip to what those things are as you, as you make more movies. But basically then um, um, I ended up starting to work as a production executive for a company called Signature for this producer uh, called uh, Moshe Diamant. And he made, uh, you know, all the Jean-Claude Van Damme movies in the 90s, the big ones like Time Cop and Hard Target. And, um, and, uh, and you know, he taught me a lot about kind of the discipline of independent filmmaking in the professional independent world. And uh, I was able to apply that and leverage that into opportunities where, you know, when, when, uh, when you get involved in a project, it's not just can you do it for the like lowest amount of mo money, it's how are you approaching the movie and making everybody feel? As long as you don't make everybody feel like it's cheap or you're you know, beating them down to get a big deal. If they feel good about the situation, they'll give a lot, right? And so it's this, it's this balance that's very um, challenging to find. But I've, I've been very uh, fortunate because then that has created other opportunities for me to um, both creatively and physically produce. And, you know, there are a lot of different types of producers. There are producers that are, that are um, that are just strictly deal producers. That you know, their their thing is like putting the left hand to the right hand, putting like some people together for money, but they actually don't know how to make a movie. And then there are then there are people who are just strictly creative developmental producers, but they have no idea how to put a deal together, nor how to actually like physically make a movie. And then you have um, you have people who are really physically physical production oriented but they're really limited in their, in their, uh, in their scope. Like they, they know how to like do the movie, but they can't think outside the movie. They can't think about the marketing campaign, the distribution, the sales, the, you know, um, I think the trick for any successful producers to have uh, really great crossover skills in a lot of areas um, so that you, if, if you can understand what everybody's doing, you know what everybody's interest is and you can get the best and the most out of them for the movie if you figure out whatever, where everybody's interest lies and how they all fit with each other. And, you know, one guy, you know, that I really deeply respect and admire a lot is a guy like Ron Bergman, who is a creative producer. He's a production manager. He's, you know, 
he produces Ryan Johnson's movies and we're friends and, and, and he's been a you know, supporter. I've been supportive of him. And, you know, that's kind of the example of, of producer that I like and respect a lot is, is somebody who thinks about all of it, understands how all of it fits together and knows how to push the whole thing forward. And, um, you know, personally, I'm at that spot where I, I immodestly can say that I'm very good at what I do. I understand it. Um, and, and now it's a question of, um, looking at each opportunity, even though we listen, we all have to earn a living and keep our currency going in the business. But I look at each situation and I go, what type of people are working on this? And what kind of a project is this? You know, sometimes you have to take something because you really got to make some money. Right. But you hopefully when you look at that and you go, right. Um, let me look at who's involved in what the thing is. Right. If it's not too bad, you just look at the ratio and go, okay, if it's 20%, asshole, right? 20% negative people or situation or whatever it is, but 80% like cool. And there's something about it that works. And overall you see how you can make that work. Then you can, you can deal with the 20%, but when it's only 10 or 20% good and good 10 or 20% good things. And half of that is the money. And the other half of it is that there's like two people that like you like, on it, but every everybody else and everything about it and the script and, and the whole project as a whole just sucks. And you can feel like when you come out of the other end of it, you're going to need to be hospitalized. Then it's, it's good to try and like not, you know, not do it if you're privileged enough to be able to have something else to do. Um, because, you know, like they say, you, you, you just have to say yes until you can't say yes anymore uh, because you're too busy. Right. So um, it's, it's challenging because, a lot of people want to get into this. It's a privilege to work in this. And, and it's, um, you know, people think, well, you know, uh, how can you, how can you not do something right? Like uh, people will kill for an opportunity. I get it. I get it. And it's just part of the things that you have to think about when you're, when you're surviving and living in this, in this very special thing that kind of has us ensnared in the way that it does, because once you realize that this is what you do, you kind of have to roll with how it works and, and what your place is in it is and the ups and the downs, the ebbs and the flows and, and all of that. Well, you mentioned earlier that you have something possibly in the fall. We're obviously about to um, hopefully soon knock on wood where it looks like we might be getting to go out of our house once in a while. Um, what, what's your pl- what's the, what's the plan goal? What's coming up for this next couple of months or this year to the end of the year, aside from the fall thing? Well, I mean, it's, it seems like this is going to be the movie of the year, you know, like if, if it comes together, you know, it's, it's like you still, you do what you always do, which is uh, you plant the seeds for different things to happen. And, you know, you can always tell the way a project is going based on what people have, what elements people have at the moment that they, they approach you with it, or you become invited into something or you, you figure out your part in it. And, and the trick is you always look at it and you go, right, you've got this, 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 and this. Uh, you're missing this and this. I can give you this, but you're still missing that. And without that, I can't help you with that, but I might be able to ha- get somebody to help you with that. And then you got a whole thing. And then if I see that there's the ability for me to be a force, because that's what I try and be when I get involved in something is to be the force. I go, right, this only needs this to happen. So let me, boom, I can push that into existence, right? Um, but the whole world of this has changed in a way where you, the predictable models of that are not totally there. Um, because it's all contingent on the business coming back, which it will, but your timing is just, you know, the way you run your game for your timing is, is completely off. But, um, basically I did a movie, um, a few years ago in Puerto Rico that I was very proud of because we, um, we had been hit with a hurricane in in prep, which was hurricane Irma. And then four days into principal photography, we were hit with hurricane Maria, which devastated the island. And, um, and I stayed for it and, uh, and, and it was called driven. It was the John DeLorean story. We're the first to kind of come out with that, that project, with that story. And when that happened, I, uh, it was just kind of a life changing event because everything that I've ever done in filmmaking and as a professional, as a person coalesced in this one moment to figure out how to move forward. So in the face of what is arguably absolutely a catastrophic thing that almost nobody has ever had to go through in filmmaking, which is a hurricane destroys the island. You're under martial law. 
And within two weeks of the island completely being destroyed and being under martial law, we figured out a way to come back and start shooting again. Um, and we felt kind of a, 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 a moral duty to the crew that if there was a way to make it happen, we should do it because that money would go into the economy directly into their pockets being spent and rebuilding their lives. And it gives them a sense of purpose and sense of work. So um, I don't want to sound like, you know, arrogant or whatever about it, but I, I think what I'm trying to say is that I understand the nature of a catastrophic event and how it affects people's lives. And, and within the framework of production, what coming back and working means and what it can do. And, and, um, and under all of these strange things that were going on because we were on an island. So it's not like I, you know, could just go and, you know, drive to the next state or do, you know, we were trapped on an island with only one way in and out and, um, and only a finite amount of resources, no food and no gasoline and, you know, potable water. And, you know, we found a way to do it. And I think we're going to do the same thing here, which is we're going to find the conditions under which we could figure out a way to continue moving forward. And, um, and ultimately what happened with that film is that we, we finished the movie. We struggled to maintain the quality of the movie. We, you know, we were, we were just glad we got through it, but we were hoping we, we could all the way through it, maintain the quality of the movie. We did because then, um, that film closed the Venice Film Festival and premiered in Toronto and was sold to Universal. And, and um, it's something we're all proud of having made. Um, I feel very similarly about this. And that, oddly, coincidentally, the director and producer that I worked with on that film are the ones that are making this film, where we, um, we, had, uh, we reunited late last year talking about this new film that we had fully financed. And it's fully financed, so we're ready to go. We're casting right now. Um, and it's unusual because the business doesn't know how to bounce back. The insurance industry isn't there. The bond companies don't know how to come. Nobody knows how to come back. And once you come back, the traditional model of how you make a film in this kind of thing is you get a sales company involved. They go to Cannes. You get, you get a star attached. They go to Cannes or they go to the AFM. They do some sales. You have those contracts. You get some loans against those contracts. You start cash flowing the movie. You have a combination of the sales contracts and tax credits and equity all kind of combining in a way where you can move forward with the film. Um, and that's the traditional model of making these, let's say outside of a Netflix or a studio that would just do a straight green light or something like that. So um, most of the film world, that's the, the thing that a lot of people don't understand is that 95% of the film world is independent. It's only this very small, like six studios that green light and a lot of times there, there are, you know, the, the amount of productions that actually come out is very small. Um, the TV world is where they make a lot of money. And in the feature world, they only commission a few movies a year and everything else is, is the responsibility of the independent world to cobble together and then sell it to the studios for distribution. So, um, so that model of making movies right now is, is, is threatened and broken um, because we, we have no way to operate. We have no way to like make sales. And, you know, although can is going to have a virtual market and people are going to start, they're starting to package now and to sell and, 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 and basically going, okay, we're going to sell this and get it ready so that once we, we, you know, we can work, we're going to start shooting the movie. So um, that's our kind of, we're, we're in a unique space in that we have um, independent equity that's financing and backing the movie. Um, we don't have to go through the traditional banking process and we're in a, we're in a strong position to start and the world enables us to start. Um, it's kind of, um, a, a oddly, only a blessing in disguise because it, it, I think what it's done for a lot of us, um, is really made us look at what we're doing. You know, listen, we got to make money so, and, you know, and keep, if we had any, any you know thoughts about how miserable we were? Well, it just got worse, right? And and one of the things that I always like to say after the whole hurricane thing happened, and you know, whenever I would show like a doc about what it was like to overcome that, all that to people, which it's online actually, it's YouTube. It's called The Making of Driven, and if you watch it, I don't think have you seen that, Rob? Yeah. Oh yeah. So when you know when you watch it, the one thing you come out of it, and you can say, listen, it can always be worse, right? So. Uh, now we're suffering through the worst that it is so that when we come back, right, 
we'll all have this perspective. Look, it could be a lot worse. We're working. We're happy. We're here. We're working. It's good. Let's just get on with it, right? So I think we'll all have a common reference point in misery <laughs> to say, listen, it this you're pissed off about this thing that you're not getting or this situation, wherever. Remember when you were stuck in your house and you couldn't work and you were broke and you know how shitty the world was, right? Remember that, right? People will forget because that's that's the nature of human beings, right? But at least over the next year or two, it's a good common reference point that we'll all have. Um, and for us to be kind of grateful for what we do have and to make the opportunities and the situations that we have um, uh, count, you know? Um, so I'm trying to be positive about it. Well, actually, I'm going to end it there because <laughs> that was actually perfectly said, perfectly done, perfectly ended and everything. But I just, um, I really wanted to, I mean, again, I'm, use, I'm obviously utilizing a lot of my friends on these things because we talk a lot. But sometimes it's cool to to get different sides of it because usually when we're talking, it's just, you know, banter about stupid things or whatever, like getting, you know, injections in our face or something like that or whatever but um i just uh i, I just i wanted to kind of you know get your side of it and what's going on because you're in the you know you're in the depths of it and and you know I, I appreciate you coming on and 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 doing this for me i know that you're crazy busy and you've got like a million things going on so for you to be able to put at least a few minutes for me i, I definitely appreciate it i mean we've been friends for going on 20 years i think or something close to that yeah, so about 20 years yeah yeah and listen, I'm very, listen, you, you know, uh, I'm very grateful to you. you know, I, I know, I know how, you know, like you, you know, you, you, um, you have, uh, always look, I came here and you're, your one friend and like in LA, that's, that's, that means a lot. If you're a year one friend, like, yeah, like you, from the first year of struggle here, you know, you're a person that I connected with and, and you, um, you help really, really were there for me when I, you know, in the, in the formative years of everything. And also, you know, along the way, whenever there's a, a thing to do or a problem to solve or a situation, whatever you're, you're there. And I'm, I just want you to know that I'm, I am grateful, although, you know, the nature of how we, all of us in the film and entertainment business are, is that like, we don't talk for like, you know, six months. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's like yesterday, right? We, we start right up because we're always kind of in the same place of like, being where we are at the moment. And then, you know, it's it, somebody made a really good joke about relationships in this business. It only works with people who understand the concept of the pause button. So you just go, I'll be right back. <laughs> and then you like, you press play again. And you're like, Oh, but wait, it's, it's supposed to now just continue. Right. <laughs> kind of the nature of, um, the nature of, um, uh, of this thing that we chose that chose us that we chose that chose us. All right. Well, I, I'm glad you're healthy and you're staying safe and things are going good. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sad to see that your uh, rock and roll Ralph's around the corner has a hundred people who have the coronavirus. So I'm assuming you're going to go shopping someplace else at this point. But, yeah. I'm having, uh, you know, I'm having food delivery done. Yeah. I went, I went vegetarian last year and, and there's some really great uh, options and I'm having it delivered to my house and, Amazon fresh as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm just trying not to do that at all. But that is my route that yeah. like it is walking distance from my place. And I, I went down there the other day and you wait, you're lying, you get your thing, but you're thinking, you know, it's going to happen here. You just know, <laughs> you just know, right. Yep. And the LA times is a big blowout saying, you know, outbreak at Ralph's great. Yeah. You know. um, all right. Well, uh, again, the, my name, my, the show is cool, calm, connected. Cause you know, I've been connected forever since day one, as we just said. Um, but I always, at the end, I always try to tell people, you know, if you, and you, especially if you need anything or if you, you know, you can always pick up the phone and ask me, cause you know that I'm always there for you or whatever. But again, I do really appreciate you doing this with me and being creative with me and, and giving me a little insight into the movie business. And hopefully we can, start working again pretty damn soon because i am just over it at this point i want to get out there <laughs> me too yeah right i'm sure yeah. um but it'll happen it's a few months away but it'll happen all right sir thank you very much and um i'm sure i will talk to you soon take care you too